I want to kind of start on the issue of government and faith from a 30,000 foot view. I want to show you kind of where we are today and then take you back to where we've been to see if we can find some applications out of that. So starting with where we are today, we are a very, very blessed people despite the things that we complain about often. Uh, we have been blessed with a form of government unlike any other in the world. There's 192 nations at the UN this year, and that number goes up and down every year. But of those nations, we are the only one who's been under the same form of government for 236 years. Same piece of paper for that entire time. If you look at Europe, and Europe is considered to be somewhat stable, uh, France has had 15 constitutions in the same time we've had one. Poland has had seven constitutions since 1919. Russia has four since 1917. Afghanistan's had five constitutions since 1923. Every other nation seems to average a revolution or a turnover in government every generation or so, not us. We've had one for that entire duration of time. That's unprecedented. But we've been different for the reason of a philosophy, quite frankly. Um, ideas lead to results. And so we've had ideas that have been different from other nations. And that's what I want to hit for a moment, is what philosophy caused us to have the stability and the prosperity that we have. And you go back to our founding document, to our birth certificate. And that birth certificate in 45 words, our founding fathers told the rest of the world, as, as they said, they wanted to tell the other nations why we were doing what we were doing. But I want to take the first 45 words and look at the first three principles of government. These were number one, two, three on their list of six principles. You start with the statement that says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. From this, the first point we're told is they believe that from an official government standpoint that there is a divine creator. This was not a declaration of private individuals. This was an announcement to the world of what we in the United States, uh, the Continental Congress, were, were telling them on why we were doing what we're doing. On the day that they finished the Bill of Rights, they on that day asked President Washington to declare a national day of Thanksgiving. It was the first National Day of Thanksgiving we had in America. We'd had some as the Continental Congress, but the first time in a federal capacity. And Washington issued this proclamation. And by the way, we've been very blessed. We own about 100,000 documents from before 1812. So I own thousands of the handwritten documents of Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Adams, etc. This is the original proclamation that was issued by George Washington in 1789. What's significant is why did he issue a National Thanksgiving proclamation? The very first paragraph, I want you to see the philosophy behind his thinking. Why was it that he called the people to stop and acknowledge God and thank God? And this is what he said. He said, it is the duty. And I would emphasize the word duty. That's a strong word that we don't use in this generation near as much. It is a word that has consequences with it. But he said, it's the duty of all nations to do four things. Nations are, number one, to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God. Number two, they are to obey His will. Number three, nations are to be grateful for His benefits. And number four, nations are humbly to implore his protection and favor. And please notice that it's nations, it's not individuals. So this is a corporate responsibility we have as a people to acknowledge God, to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly to implore his protection and favor. And so convinced were they of how important this was as a people and a country that even if you take one of our least religious founding fathers like Thomas Jefferson, he said, can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we remove their only firm basis. Now, according to Thomas Jefferson, our least religious founding father, what is the only firm basis of national liberties? He said, it is a conviction, and I would emphasize the word conviction. It is a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God, that they're not to be violated, but with his wrath. He said, indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and his justice cannot sleep forever. Now, Jefferson says the only way you can preserve your liberties is you have to have a conviction in your mind that those liberties come from God and that if you start messing with them, you're going to tick him off and then we're all going to be in trouble. The second point, let me point you to the phrase where they said that we're endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. From that, the second point we hold in government is that there are certain rights that come from God, not government. There's a certain set of rights we got just because we're human beings, period, across the board. No government gave them. You find these rights given in the scriptures before there was ever a government in place. They're God-given rights. I also love the way that Alexander Hamilton talks about these rights. He says, inalienable rights are not to be rummaged for among old parchments or musty records. Now, they're not in government documents. He says, they're written as with a sunbeam in the whole volume of human nature by the aid of the divinity itself and can never, and can never be erased or obscured by mortal power. 
These aren't rights that you find in a document. These are rights that come from God before there was ever a government in place. Well, when you look at what's included in able rights, those who wrote the documents talking about able rights tell us what they are. For example, if you take Sam Adams, and Sam Adams is called the father of the American Revolution, he said, well, we told you in the document that there were three among others. And he said those three were, first, a right to life, secondly, to liberty, and thirdly, to property. So life, liberty, and property were three God-given rights that, that preceded any human government. But as the Declaration said, these three were among others. And so 11 years later, when we had finished the, the revolution and we're now writing, we've written the Constitution and we're now writing the Bill of Rights, they went back and said, you remember we told you there were three among others? Let us give you some of the others. And so the Bill of Rights goes through and lists other unalienable rights, rights that come from God, not government. The right to worship God according to the dictates of conscience, the biblical right of self-defense, the sanctity of the home. Go through all the amendments. They're all God-given rights. They were all set apart from government. Government was not to touch those rights. And by the way, let me point out that here in Texas, we used to have this philosophy very clearly. Our Supreme Court of Texas, back in 1913, dealt with the issue of civil unions back in 1913. At that point in time, the Supreme Court of Texas has now said, well, it says marriage was created when God made Adam and he made Eve and put them together and they had a family. And it went through and said, marriage is a biblical institution created by God. We in civil government have no right to regulate something we didn't create. It is his institution. We want to, they said it would be sacrilegious to call a civil contract when it's something that God created. We have no authority to regulate something he created. So that was the belief on the separation of, of jurisdictions. So that is the second belief that we hold is, number one, there is a divine creator. Number two, he gives certain guaranteed rights. And look at the third part of those 45 words. It says that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Now, their belief was that government exists to protect inalienable rights. That's the first purpose of government is to protect inalienable rights. A uh, number of founding fathers made this very clear. James Wilson, he says, the principal object of government, number one thing of government, is to acquire a new security for the enjoyment of rights which we were previously entitled by the immediate gift of our all-wise and all-beneficent creator. If God has given us an able right, the principal purpose of government is to make sure that we can pursue the right that God's given us. So that was understood as being the purpose of government. Now, Sam Adams said a very similar thing. Sam Adams says government was originally designed for the preservation of the inalienable rights. Now, this is when he also said, and by the way, those rights are the right to life, to liberty, and to property. That's why government was instituted to protect those issues. And in this day and age, we thought, we think, wouldn't it be really good if that thing about the right to life had applied to abortion, you know? But we've been dealing with the March for Life for 40 years and et cetera. If they'd just been talking about abortion, it would help us today, and I don't know why we think they weren't talking about abortion. Bible says there is nothing new under the sun. As long as people have been pregnant, there were people who didn't want to be pregnant. Abortion is nothing new. As a matter of fact, in the collection of works that we have, here's a book on abortion in America back in 18, 1808. It is not a new issue. It has not been a new issue. What has changed is technology. So when he says a right to life, literally, that's what he means. None of the founding fathers wrote about that. Let me take you back for a moment to James Wilson. This is what James Wilson wrote in his law book, telling students about laws. He says, with consistency, beautiful and undeviating. Human life, from its commencement to its close, is protected by the common law. He said, in the contemplations of law, life begins when the infant is first able to stir in the womb, and by the law, that life is protected. Now, the point of technology is, as soon as you know there's an infant inside, it's protected by the common law. The signer of the Declaration, John Witherspoon, actually took a step further, and he said, this is what makes a difference between America and Europe. He said, in Europe, they believe that parents create children. And therefore, in Europe, they allow abortions in Europe. He said, but in America, we don't believe parents create children. We believe God creates children. Therefore, we do not allow abortions here because life comes from God, not from parents. Now, see, this is something that they talked about, they wrote about. It was in the law books. Abortion was a common law offense, a violation of common law. So we have across America this huge protection for rights of conscience. John Quincy Adams said very simply, he said, the transcendent and overruling principle of the first settlers of New England was conscience. That's what drove people here. And so when they got here, guess what? They wanted to protect rights of conscience. Now, James Madison understood that, and this is what James Madison said. He said, government is instituted to protect property of every sort. Remember, government's protecting inalienable rights, those first three inalienable rights, life, liberty, property. He said, government's instituted to protect property of every sort. He said, conscience is the most sacred of all property. Now, we think of property sometimes as real estate, 
Conscience is property. Government exists to protect property of which conscience is the most important part of property. You also have George Washington who talked about the rights of conscience in this way. He said we should be very cautious of violating the rights of conscience in others, ever considering that God alone is the judge of the hearts of men, and to him only they're answerable. Government doesn't judge the hearts of men. Therefore, government has to say, all right, I may not agree with you, but I respect your right of conscience because you answer to God. You don't answer to government for what you do. Now, this is where it gets fun because these guys were very familiar with the concept of separation church and state. First Amendment, this is what we point to for separation church and state. Okay, this, this amendment, you read it, the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion prohibiting the free exercise thereof. There are two clauses there. The first is called the Establishment Clause. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. Co Congress can't make us all the same religious practice or habit or anything else. And second, Congress can't prohibit the free exercise thereof. That's the free exercise clause. But notice, the only entity limited by the First Amendment is Congress. It doesn't limit individuals, doesn't limit people, doesn't limit hospitals or doctors, doesn't limit kids, it, doesn't, it limits Congress. That's the, because their version of separation church and state was it was always the government trying to intrude into religious affairs. They weren't scared of faith. They're scared of the government trying to regulate faith. So that's their view of separation church and state. Because of that, we protect the rights of conscience for all sorts of folks that the country may not agree with. I mean, quite frankly, we protect the rights of conscience for conscientious objectors. As much as we are pro our soldiers and we support our soldiers, we also support the right of people who say, I want nothing to do with that. It had been Quakers at the time of the American Revolution. It's now all sorts of other groups. But we don't force people to fight in wars against their conscience. We have conscience protection also for Jehovah's Witnesses. We patriotic, love the country. We have states across the country saying the Pledge of Allegiance, but we do not re require Jehovah's Witnesses to say the Pledge of Allegiance. They believe they pledge only to God loyalty. They don't pledge loyalty to any human authority. So we don't require Jehovah's Witness. That's freedom of conscience. We have the same thing with the Amish. They say everybody else has compulsory education, 12 years of education. Amish say, no, under our faith, eight years is all you need. Eight years is all we believe the Bible requires. to go, great, have eight years. We're not going to have you require you to have 12 like everybody else in the nation. Same Christian scientists and vaccinations. You got to have vaccination to go to school unless you happen to be Christian scientists and then your faith says, we don't do that to our children. So we say, fine, you don't do that to your children. That's the rights of conscience. Same with Muslim and Jewish men not required to shave their beards. You can work in the places that you have to be clean shaven. Oh, if you're Jewish or Muslim and, and you're practicing your faith, you don't have to be clean shaven despite what our policies say. The same with Seventh-day Adventists. I don't want to work on Saturday. Yeah, but my job requires you to work from Monday through Saturday. Well, not for Seventh-day Adventists. They have the right by conscience to not be fired for not working on their day of worship. So if I take you back to these three principles of American government, there's a divine creator. The divine creator gives enable rights to man. Government exists to secure those rights. One thing I can point out for dead certain is a secular government will never be a limited government. You got secular leaders, they will get involved in all sorts of areas that they should not be involved with, including the rights of conscience. Show me any secular government in Europe that is not intruded into the rights of conscience. It just it won't happen. You have to have leaders who believe there's a creator, he gives rights, government exists to protect those rights, therefore I will not touch those. That's out of my jurisdiction. I can't I can't do that. So there's a political solution to this. But that's the historical history that we have. This is a well-protected, well-defined right in American history. Thank you guys for letting me share with you. Tim, thank you, sir.